Psalms, the fifth division, verses one through three. I want to read just a few more verses from that same psalm because it talks about conversations and how people lie when we ought to be a people of truth. Can I get a witness? The fifth division of Psalm, verses 6 through 12, New Living Translation, says this. You will destroy those who tell lies. The Lord detests murderers and deceivers. Because of your unfailing love, I can enter your house. I will worship at your temple and deepest awe, with deepest awe. Lead me in the right path, O Lord, or my enemies will conquer me. Make your way plain for me to follow. My enemies cannot speak a truthful word. Their deepest desire is to destroy others. Their talk is foul like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with flattery. This is in your Bible if you haven't tore it out. O oh God, declare them guilty. Let them be caught in their own traps. Drive them away because of their many sins, for they have rebelled against you. But... Let all who take refuge in your rejoice. Let them sing joyful praises forever. Spread your protection over them, that all who love your name may be filled with joy. For you bless the godly. O oh Lord, you surround them with your shield of love. We're going to talk today, straight talk. We're going to have straight talk. Our guest today that's going to come up and share with you all is uh, very dear friends of mine, Lynn and David Gilkey. They have uh, committed their lives to young people. They're in just about every high school in the city. They go around, they talk. Uh, the name of the organization is Rise Up for Youth. Is that it? Rise Up for Youth. Amen? And it's time that we did. Amen? Because they are the future. And if we really be real, my brothers and sisters, us, parents, grandparents, and others, we done messed some stuff up. We done messed some stuff up because we done kept our mouth closed. We done saw things happen in our communities right outside of some of our homes, and we won't speak up. We won't say anything. We won't encourage our children to say anything. We, are, we have even taken the position that as long as it's not my house or my family, it don't matter. God made us to be relational. When he said it's not good for man to be alone, he wasn't just talking about the female and a husband and wife relationship. He's talking about all relationships. You've heard the saying, no man is an island. Amen? It takes a village to raise a child. You know, I remember growing up in Mississippi, Lynn, when we got out of hand doing Sunday school or doing church, we talked in church or played too much, there was an usher or a mother or somebody, deacon, father, somebody, grab you by the ear. Come on, help me, somebody. Grab you by your collar, grab you by your pants, they used to say they'll grab you by the nap of your neck, and y'all know what I'm talking about. Amen? It takes all of us. And I don't know how you all feel about it, but it just breaks my heart every time we have to do a funeral for another young person. Well, not only that, when 
we have to go downtown to the city or the county jail to visit another young person. Or have to go out to Winfield or Hutchison and you got 18, 19, 20 year olds in there. It's time for us to speak up, to see something, say something. Do you all know that in Wichita, Kansas, just this year alone, the crime rate in Wichita is 10.41. The whole state of Kansas is 3.8. Wichita has more crime in it than the whole rest of the cities in Kansas combined. There have been, and my records, it may be a day or two late, so far, 31 murders here in Wichita, 309 rapes, 400 and, I'm, I'm sorry, 652 robberies, and 3,145 assaults this year in our city. It says that we have more crime here per capita as far as land and size of cities. We are ranking number two in the country. Other cities that are ranked that are about our same size, number two. There's only one other city that has more crime than us, our size, in our country. I don't know how y'all feel about this yet. This may just be me wasting my time, but you know what the Lord told me to do it, and I'm going to do it. Property crime comparisons, Wichita is up to 54.26% of property crimes. The state of Kansas is only 26.96. One in 18 Wichitans will, have a vi will be a victim of some type of property crime. One in 37 in the state of Kansas. Again, these numbers might not mean none to you, but they are alarming to me. When you talk about property crime, burglary, I told you 3,601 burglaries, 15,364 thefts, and 2,193 motor vehicle thefts here in Wichita this year. See, Pastor Stuckey shared something with me when we first got acquainted. He said, you know, I didn't know what was going on in the African American community or on the north side because I live over here in Riverside and really I just wasn't paying attention. Some of us right here, these are happening right here in our community, in our neighborhoods, around our whole city, and some of us didn't even know. We're going through life like everything is all right and your neighbor may have just got robbed or may or just got assaulted. There are rapes, remember what I told you? It, there are over, as far as rapes in this city, three, 309 rapes, have, that's reported rapes. Let me put it like that. Reported rapes in the city of Wichita. You see something, you have to say something. I'm almost done, and I'm gonna bring Le, uh, Lynn and David up here so that they can carry on from what they shared with the kids on yesterday and some more statistics and things they want to share with you all on today. But my brothers and sisters, we have to get to a point that we take this thing seriously. And if we don't take our communities back, we will not have a community. This is not just a black thing. I got statistics here about white on white crimes and Hispanic on Hispanic crime. We are killing each other, every race. This is all over the city. There's a statistic, and I have deals here, I have maps that shows. This is the city of Wichita, and every red deal shows where a crime has taken place here in the city of Wichita. Not just the Northeast area, but it's all over, the, it's all over this city. And that's a shame. Again, we're number two in the country of cities our size in crime. 
that's not a proud, that's not no something to be proud about. Amen? So again, we're going to have straight talk. What, what we're going to do, David and Lena is going to come up and they're going to share their story and then we're going to come and I'm going to ask you all some questions. I got, I got two or three questions I want to ask and I want to hear from you. Again, you know, we say see something, say something. This is your opportunity to really say something. Okay, say how you feel about what's going on in your community. In your community. Right now, we're going to hear from David and Lynn Gilkey. First, I'd like to give honor to God and to this wonderful congregation, to the ministers of this church. Uh, I'd like to say thank you for allowing us to be here this morning and uh, share our personal testimonies and what we're doing in the community today. And uh, since I am in the house of the Lord and I do love the Lord, uh, I have to give him his praise and his glory for what he has done in my life. I would not, uh, I don't think I could, could sleep tonight if I did not uh, testify of the goodness of the Lord in my life. As I sat back there, I, I've been praying and I've been asking God to put the words in my mouth of what he wanted me to say. And, and as I sat back there, I looked at the congregation and I I was really staring at all these beautiful, uh, wise women. And I thought how family dynamics is not what they used to be. And I'm gonna say that one more time. Our families are not what they used to be. And when I looked at the audience and, and and I'm so blessed to be in the presence of you women. And there's something about um, mothers that hold families together, even when there's no man in the house. And how mothers were born to protect their children. So I start by sharing my testimony and my, a little bit about myself. My mother died when I was three years old. She died, uh, she died in childbirth, having my younger sister at Wesley Medical Center. She had a heart attack. She was 36 years old. She had already had eight kids. And back in the 60s, one cesarean was too much. She continued to have cesareans, and her heart gave out on the delivery table. So at three years old, my family dynamics changed. My father was left to raise all of his children, all the eight of us, by himself. And it's something about when a young child does not have her mother bad things happen. My uh, father, before he passed away, he was able to share with me that he uh, came up on some financial difficulties. Again, this was in the 60s, and so he made a decision to send me to some extended family members. And I used to be ashamed to share this, but this is part of my testimony. Bad things happen to me. And I'm seeing that it is uh, some young people in the audience, so I want you adults to use your imagination. Bad things happen to me. And it's something about when a young girl's innocence is taken away, something happens. Something's broke. And I was that little girl that was broken. Like I said in the beginning, families are not like they used to be. It used to be a father in the home, a mother in the home, a grandmother in the home. Families are not like they used to be. 
And so for me, my family was broken. And so at a very, very young age, I started to make some poor choices. Like I said, I used to be ashamed, but God has delivered me from any kind of shame in my testimony. I started using drugs at a very, very early age. And as I look in this audience, and I, and I have kids of my own, I have a daughter. The first time I used drugs was in fifth grade. Fifth grade. And I continued to make bad choices. And I'm just gonna be honest with you. I continue to make bad choices. And I want you to know that there are kids in our community that are making bad choices. And some of it is, because the family is not what they used to be. We have mothers that are incarcerated. We have fathers that are incarcerated. We have mothers that are addicted to drugs. We have fathers that are addicted to drugs. And families are not what they used to be. And so I went through high school, junior high, high school, making all the wrong choices. And I tell you why. Because I didn't have positive role models in my life. I didn't have adults that would tell me, Lynn, what are you doing? Or you don't have no business being there. Or you don't have no business hanging out there. And so as I share my story, I want, and as I look in the audience, I want us to know that we all have a responsibility to our young people. Whether they are ours or not, we all have a responsibility when we see young people doing wrong or, or when we see young people making bad choices. We cannot continue to stay in our comfort zone and, and just say, that's not my business because our kids are dying out there. Our kids are, are, are spending the rest of their lives incarcerated. Pastor DeSasia talked about the crime statistics in, in our community. And what we have to understand is that families are not what they used to be anymore. Some of our kids are going to school, being raised by elderly grandparents, because their parents are incarcerated or their parents are addicted. And they have to go to school with all this extra baggage. They're lost. I was one of those kids. I made all the wrong choices. As I barely graduated from high school, I will say that I did graduate, but barely. As some of our young people would say, barely. But I made all the wrong choices. And it caused me to suffer great consequences. I went to jail in, 2000, in September 2000. My house was raided. I was convicted with a charge of possession with intent to sell. My sentence was 15 years in prison but I will like to share God's grace and his mercy. In the Cedric County Detention Facility, I started to pray. And my attorney came to visit me, my court appointed attorney, because I didn't have no money for no attorney. But he said, Lynn, we're gonna try the prosecutor prosecutor wants to give you 15 to life, but we are going to try to get you 10. Now, I don't know about y'all, but 10, 10 I, I, was, I was like, can you do a little better than that? <laughs> but at the time, I, I, I didn't have a, a grandmother like Terry that took me to church every Sunday. I didn't have a mother. My father worked all the time. But I did know, my, I did have a stepmother that took me to church. 
And I did get an understanding of a man named Jesus. And so I began to pray. And I got on my hands and knees in that cold jail cell. And for 24 hours, I didn't eat. I just prayed. And my prayer was really, really simple. It was, God, if you get me out of this situation, I promise I will dedicate my life to helping young people not go down the same road I did. Now, some of you are older in this congregation to remember the Carr brothers. They were two brothers that were serial killers in our community. That morning, I went handcuffed to Jonathan Carr. I went to court handcuffed to Jonathan Carr. But I remember that prayer that I had prayed the night before. And it was, God, you get me out of this situation I dedicate my life to helping young girls not make the same choices that I did. Me and Jonathan Carr was handcuffed, and in that courtroom, my, my prayer was answered. The defense said there was a technicality in my case. Now, the world said it was a technicality but I knew it was an answer to my prayer. And the charges was dismissed with 18 months probation. And for that moment, Jonathan Carr had to praise God too, because I said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> so when I left that county jail, I knew that I had made a promise. And so, by his grace, I started a program to help young people make good choices. Now, I'm telling you, there's a lot of young people out there that are making bad choices. And it takes all of us to help them get on the right path. But it cannot be just me and David Gilkey. It has to be all of us. All of us has an opportunity to make a difference in a young person's life. Now, I would like to sit here and tell you that I got out of uh, jail and, and everything was, was, was roses. I wish I could say that. But it's not. Pastor DeSage has said something that really touched my heart. Because God has a plan, and his will and his plans are good. And I have to realize that. Because this, uh, these streets and, and this community has a lot, of, um, a lot of things that our young people can get into. From peer pressure, to making wrong choices, to make a wrong decision. And I will say that I am not removed from that effect in my family. I stand before you saying that I wasn't the best parent. I had an addiction for 26 years. I tried to raise my son the best that I could. But like I said, it's a lot of things out there that our young people can get into. My son, I lost my son last year, April the 2nd. There's a drug out there called K2. Some of you may have heard of it, it's Spice, K2. My son got a hold of it, he tried it, and it took his life. I am still on my journey of grief. I 
I've learned that grief is a process, it's a journey, but that would not stop me from keeping my promise to God, that I would dedicate my life to helping young people make good choices. That is what me and David has committed to, we've committed our lives to, and as I look in this audience and I see the young people, I have one of my, my girls that, that joined my program that successfully completed my program. And I will continue to help young people make better choices. And some of us have gotten so removed from young people that we don't really understand what they're going through. And we don't really understand some of the things that they are affected by. They go to school sometimes hungry. They go to schools. I've had so many stories of young girls witnessing their, their mothers being beaten by their fathers, by boyfriends. And then they have to go to school. And they have to deal with that pain. I've heard stories of my mother didn't come home last night. She's on drugs. I don't know if she's going to be alive when I get home. I hear stories of I'm being raised by my grandmother that really don't understand me. All I want to do is have fun with my friends. Our families are not what they used to be. And it's going to take all of us, all of us, to make a difference in our young people's lives. Now, my husband, he, he's straight talk. He, he works with uh, a lot of youth that are on, that, that are down there at detention, that, at the juvenile detention center facing life because of the choices that they made. But they're not hopeless. They're, they may be in a hopeless situation, but there is still hope. And it takes us, all of us, to talk to our young people, to help them go through this awkward stage of adolescence, to ask them tough questions. What's going on? Do you need help? I'm here for you. I care. What do you need? It takes all of us to do that. Like Pastor said, we cannot continue to sit in our homes and close our, sh our shades and say that's not my business. It is our business. Our young people are our future. I lost my son behind the snares of this world. And, 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 and I just want to show you my son, Ryan. I look in the audience at this young man and that young man and that young man. And I see Ryan in all of your faces. But one bad choice can change your life. And I'm speaking to the young people in the audience. One bad choice can change your life. And your choices, don't all, your choices do not just affect you. They affect your whole family. I am forever changed. I am not the woman that I used to be. Trust me, I had straight talks with Ryan. But he made the choice to use a drug that took his life.
understand why I lost my son. But I will continue to serve God and I will continue to keep my promise that I will dedicate my life to helping young people make better choices. Even through my grief, I use Ryan's story. Because when I see young people, I see me. I see Ryan. And I don't, want, I don't want to see another mother go through what I'm going through. And if there's anything that I could do to help anybody's child, anybody's niece, that is what I had promised God that I would do. Because he has been totally good to me. And I am, I, I'm in church this morning, and I have to say, he has been good to me. And I will not turn my back on him. I miss my child. I cry every single day. I'm on social media. Somebody posted a post of him uh, this morning. He was on one of those hover round boards. I cry every day. I miss my son. We are losing way too many young people, ladies and gentlemen. We are losing way too many young people to gun violence, to incarceration. My husband will share statistics. We have got to do something. God is good. And he can change things. But he needs us down here to help him. He needs us down here to help him make a difference in a young person's life. I would say God took me from the crack house to the White House. And I say that because in 2016, I was, my pro, our program was recognized by President Barack Obama as a champion of change. We are all champions. And we can all be champions of change. We have got to come out of these four walls. And we have got to continue to help our youth. Our young people are dying every day. There's a drug house probably next to some of y'all right now. Like Pastor said, see something, say something. See something. Say something. If somebody would have saw or saw the, 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 I ain't even going to go there. I ain't even going to go there. It was a purpose in my son's life. And I will continue to be an advocate for young people. So I pray that we all join this fight together to save our communities and our young people. It is time out for foolishness. It is time out of saying that is not my child. It is time out for saying that's somebody else's business. That is our business. These are our kids. And God has a plan for all of them. We, not, we cannot continue to let the enemy take our kids. So I will turn this microphone over to David Gilkey, my husband. We are both in this fight together. I hope you really, really, really understand the significance of the power that we have in saving our young people. Thank you for listening. I probably won't need this mic because my voice carries a little. Can y'all hear me? Because I'm going to come down there in a minute and get with y'all in a minute. Uh, but I'd like to give honor to God and to the pastor personally and the church. Uh, the bottom line is, guys, time is too short and hell is too hot. And we're running out of time. I'm just going to be straight with you. Uh, my wife said a lot, and uh, but we're not doing a lot. It's like she said, it's going to take all of us. You know, uh, when I, we were sitting up here, we was, you know, like she was saying, we were saying, what could we say? What we could we say? And, you know, um, like she said, our young people are dying quicker than we are. 
statistics speaks for itself. Right now at Jeff, there's 13 young people sitting there facing first degree murder. Uh, there was a shooting yesterday. There's a shooting, an assault, and a stabbing every single day in the city of Wichita. One of the three takes place right here in our city. Uh, yesterday we had a great time for the people that showed up, the young people that came out yesterday. We asked some questions and they got involved and they came with some good answers and uh, we was kind of surprised some of the stuff they were saying. I mean, they, they really got into it. I was a little bit, not surprised, but impressed because our young people have a voice. And I've been telling the pastor for a long time, if we don't give our young people the voice as adults, we in trouble. Because when I was growing up, we were seen but not heard. We don't live in those times anymore. Now y'all wonder why young people talk back so much. Because they got a voice now. They want to be heard. And if we don't give them the opportunity to speak, we're going to be in trouble. See, if you want to get to the root of the problem, you need to talk to the source. And it's our young people. Our young people are crying out for help. You know, my wife didn't mention we both were addicted to crack for 16 years of our life. I've been in two drug busts, 10 drug case felonies, four years in prison, kicked out of college, all because I didn't want to listen because I wanted to run the streets like a lot of the young people like to do today. But didn't nobody tell me the streets were designed to do two things, lock you up or kill you. And the streets ain't lost a fight yet. And it's not gonna lose one. But for some reason, you know, and I'm just gonna be real, uh, I had to ask a lot of men, are we scared of the men, the young men of today? You know, we, you know, I, I, I think, you know, somewhere along the line, we dropped the ball. I'm just going to be honest. I think I, I, and I'm speaking to the men in here right now. I'm just, you know, he said straight talk. Right, Pastor? Okay. I'm, I'm, I can't hurt you no worse than whatever you're going through. So if it hurt, just say ouch. <laughs> but. I don't think we passing down to our young, young men what our grandfathers and fathers gave us. But some, somewhere in there, I think we just said, let them do what they want to do. But I look back and I see these mothers and grandmothers and aunties crying out for help, trying to raise these young men. They can't raise them to be men. It takes a man to raise a man. It takes a woman to raise a young woman. But for some reason, it seemed like, man, we can't come together. We became these territorial creatures where give me 50 feet, back up, you're too close. But women can come together all day long. They might not can live together long, but they'll come together. I just heard that one from myself. I got six sisters. They always say that. I, 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 I just, yeah, you know, I just thought I thought it. But, but we got over 4,000 gang members in the city of Wichita. And I do gang prevention also. I went to Chicago and, and got my certification out of Chicago. Best place to ever get a gang certification, believe me or not. But we got an issue right here in our own city. We got things going on in our schools. And I'm just going to be real. It's just a matter of time before we have our first shooting in our public school. They don't search our kids. Uh, most of our teachers are scared of our young people. And I'm just being honest. It ain't even our teachers. Some of our parents are scared of their own kids. See, we're not dealing with the prodigal son. We're dealing with prodigal families now. Our families are broken. And when I say families, it ain't just our families at home. Some of our church families are broken too. Because I remember when the churches used to be the backbone of the community. There's about 37 or more churches in this community, and we can't even come together. Can't even come together. Because the first thing everybody wants to know, who's going to be on the, who's going to be on, who's, 
who gonna pay for what? Who's gonna who's gonna do, you know, while our kids are steady dying? I mentioned yesterday, I wish they should they should have put it on the news. I mentioned yesterday that this church should have been packed full of young people. But if there would have been a shooting yesterday, and they would have had a candlelight on these grounds, it would have been 100 to 200 to 300 people out here yesterday. But when it's something positive for our young people, and they always say, what can we do for our young people? What can we say? They don't show up. Then they want to blame it on the police department. They want to blame it on the preachers. The, they want to blame, everybody want to point fingers. But then you got to ask yourself, what are you doing? What are you doing? Everybody sitting in here knows some young person. Everybody in here got a cell phone. Over half of everybody in here is on Facebook. Everybody got friends on Facebook. I'm pretty sure this was out on Facebook. I saw it. But I don't think it was shared like it should be. But that's okay. Like Pastor said, this is just the beginning of something big. We got to keep doing what we're doing. We got to keep sharing about what's going on with our young generation. Because anytime you look on the news and you hear a 14, 15 year old, 16 year old dying, we have, that's a problem. When they change the laws to where there's no longer a permit or anything like that, and it's just open carry to carry a firearm, I'm not surprised that the statistics are like they are. When you say it's legal for an 18-year-old to carry a firearm with no training, it's cheaper to get a firearm than it is a cell phone on the street. And like my wife mentioned, you know, if it's, you know, we used to grow up in a neighborhood where everybody knew you within a five-block radius. You got people live right next door to you, you don't even know their name. You see kids acting up in stores and stuff. When we was growing you can, somebody could say something to your child, and it was all right. You can't say nothing to nobody's child because you're afraid something's going to happen. And it does happen. I'm old school. If I see a kid cutting up, I'm going to say something. That's just how I am. Some of that old school stuff still works today. We still here. So young people, you'll be okay. You know, if y'all was brought up, when we was brought up, it, okay. they'd call it, they, they, they would have called it child abuse. Back as you just got whooping. <laughs> you know, it was stenching cords or whatever was close. Look, see the, see the mothers know, they know. House shoes, whatever was close, it, it was okay. Now it's just, you know. I guess we, we done got too comfortable with letting our children. We, we done became our, I don't know where we come with this, we want to be our kids' friends. Then we want to have a negotiation in our homes when they're not paying the bills. They tell you when they're coming in at, at what time, what they want to eat. We don't even sit at the dinner tables anymore. Everybody get their plate, go to their room, shut the door. Only time we come together is Thanksgiving, Christmas, or a funeral. But other than that, everybody do their thing. But yesterday, we had a great time. But like we say, it, it's time for straight talk. I'm going to show you some pictures of a lot of people. And y'all might know a lot of these people on these posters that lost their lives right here in this community. Can I get a Two of my young men that's in brotherhood, a former student, and one of my other students that's in brotherhood, come up right quick and hold these posters for me. These two young men here was here yesterday. And these 
these, these people you see on these posters are people that died right here in this community over the years. Wrong place at the wrong time. Some of them was in my program. I done lost 13 boys since I've been doing this work, working with young men. It's 13 to homicide. Last year, I lost a young man because he got kicked out of school and his father shot and killed him because he got kicked out of school. I lost a young man this year. On Juneteenth, we and me and my wife just was in a parade with some of the kids in the program. We took them out to eat. And an hour later, one of the young men in my program got shot right there up on Harding when they had that shooting. Still got the bullet in his leg. Fragment still in his head. On his way to college on a football scholarship, now he can't go. That's what our young people are dealing with. That's what they're dealing with, guys. And this is the kind of conversations we got to have with our young people, with everyone, period. The truth needs to be the truth. We can no longer sugarcoat what's happening in our community. We can no longer think that this is going to go away. It's going to get worse and worse. If we don't do something now, this is what's going to continue to happen. I'm going to redo these posters because i got to put my own son on here and share his story. I can tell you pretty much how a lot of these people on these posters lost their lives. I know how they lost their lives. It's good people on these posters, but someone took their lives. And I'm pretty sure you guys know some of these people that are on these posters. But if we don't start talking about what's really going on in our city and community, this is what we're going to continue to keep having go on in our community. But we're getting ready to open this floor up. Pastor going to come up with a few questions, and we're going to open it up for some straight talk and, and, and see what we can come up with today before we walk up out of here. So I'm going to turn the floor over back to the pastor. I appreciate you allowing me and my wife to come out if there's anything that Rise Up for Youth can do, me and my wife can do to help any of you young people, uh, parents, if you have teens that need our help, we work out of the office at the Urban League on 9th and Grove. We are open book. We are in five high schools. We're at North, we're at East, we're at West, Southeast, and Northwest. She deals with the girls and I deal with the young men. We're in five high schools. By the end of, hopefully by 2020, we'll be in all seven high schools here in Wichita. Our goal is to get in all the high schools and then start going into the middle schools that feed into the high schools. We, don't, we go on college tours. We take them on prison tours. We do workshops. We do scholarships. We do whatever it takes to save our young people. But we can't do it by ourselves. We need your help, your support. Like Pastor said, if you see something, say something. That's the bottom line. So I'm going to turn it over to Pastor. Thank you. My brothers and sisters, I know, I know, I know the hour is getting there, but I wanted to, and I'm going to have a couple of the preachers that go down and get a couple of mics. I want to hear from you. What do you think about your community, about your city of Wichita? What's, what's going on? See, Again, when we say see something, say something, and we put it out there for you, a lot of you still not doing it. And again, this is for anybody. How do you feel about your community? Do you feel safe in your own house? Do you feel safe in your neighborhood? What would you like to see happen in Wichita? Somebody, get us started out, somebody. We got one back here, amen. This is an issue. If you go in my office, you'll see a picture of David and Lynn's son up on, on my bulletin board, because he's the same age as my son. I saw them boys grow up together. 
Ryan, his last job was right down the street from my house, and I used to see him. 